Philippe, thank you for all of the kind words you had for me. Thank you, and thank you, of course, uh, James. Um, what I did uh, was, of course, read your uh, study, uh, your index, and it's a fascinating study, and it's a, uh, it's a very important one. We were talking before with uh, Philippa having a sort of a, uh, a post-breakfast and uh, asking about, you know, talking about what is happening in the world or what was happening first in Britain that separates part of the population from the elite. And I thought I was listening to Peru, and I thought I was listening to all the other countries I work in. I work roughly off and on with about 30 heads of state on very specific matters relating to, as a matter of fact, those who are marginalized. And uh, it's all there, but as you said, in different ways. People go from poverty to prosperity. Uh, in uh, according to different circumstances. If you've never had the government on your side, you don't ask for government services, you ask for something different. But essentially, I think it all is pretty much part of the same thing. So what I'm going to do is taking advantage of some slides, uh, present you uh, two cases where there are people that are wanting to come from a state of relative poverty to prosperity and having a hard time. Uh, we, I had a team of about 120 people in uh, Egypt at the time of the Arab Spring, so we're talking end of 2010, when Mohammed uh, Bouazizi in the fair city of Sidi Bouzid, Tunisia, uh, lights up and uh, self-immolates, complaining that uh, life is treating him misery. That's him on the, on the left. Supposedly, immediately, the European press gets together and says what happened is they took away his fruit cart from him. And a policewoman had just previously slapped him, and it was a question of dignity, and he lit up. Uh, the French trades unions immediately got together and uh, invited the mother and the sisters to Paris and set up La Place Boisizi, and then afterwards followed up by the municipalité that did La Rue Boisizi for the fallen proletariat. Now, we seem to have recognized who uh, Bozizi was, so we actually went out and uh, put a team of first three Peruvians, and then together with our team from Egypt, about 70 people, to find out what this was all about. And uh, what we found out is that between the time that Bozizi lit up and the time he died, which was 2011, just about a month, a month and a half later, in those two months, four governments fell. So he, obviously, he had said something that touched the collective subconscious or the collective conscious. But we also found out that he wasn't the only one to light up in that time, because we were able to read systematically <clears throat> Arabic newspapers, we found out, that he committed suicide simultaneously with 63 other people all throughout the Middle East. Those 63 other people, we documented it and published a book, which is the best seller in the Maghreb and in North Africa. It is now in uh, PBS, Public Broadcasting System. It's still today, I think it comes out once a week. And it's called uh, Different Kinds of Heroes or something like that. And it consists of the interviews with these, uh, with these people. So what was interesting also is we collected people with their phones who were there at the moment of suicide. In other words, when you commit suicide, if you do it the Roman way, you quietly go, you get into a bathtub, it's warm water, you cut your veins and you go away peacefully. But if you decide to do it like, um, uh, like Joan of Arc, it's a very painful moment. And if you're doing it, it's because you want to make a statement. So who was around? And there was a lot of people around as they shouted the reasons of why they took their life away, these 64 people. And we've got pretty much all the 64 recordings. And the recording of Mohammed Bouazizi was, Les pauvres ont aussi le droit de vendre et acheter. The poor also have the right to buy and sell. And when he lit up, he was wearing Nike uh, tennis shoes, white socks, blue jeans, a white t-shirt, and a basketball la jacket, and had short hair, and there wasn't one mood around, and there wasn't one political mention, nor him, nor his 63 other people. There was no religious mention. They just had two words. One word was, I'm thinking of our conversation, Philippa. One word was, uh, they've taken away 
ils ont pris mon Razelmel, Razelmel being in uh, Arabic uh, capital. Ils ont pris mon Razelmel. They had no problem, like we do. I mean, if you go in Peru and start saying, Viva el Capital, you will not get elected. But obviously, it's not that way. In the Middle East, le Capital is something very important. And uh, that was one. And the other one was a word in Arabic uh, called hogera, which has something to do with disdain, alienation, when you're looked down upon if you're a member of the bazaar. And so as we went around and started trying to find out what he was doing, we started to find out that hey, the reason that he committed suicide was because, first of all, He liked his family very much, but you know, one fellow was a carpenter, the other one was an artist. His mother scolded him all the time. His sisters were going to university. He wanted to do business. So he had to associate with other people outside the family. Now, the way you associate with other people outside the family is you form a corporation, you form a company. They took away his right to form a company. He wanted to use his house, a certificate, convert it into a title so he could get a mortgage and finance his first Mitsui truck to be able to take uh, to his three spots in the market. Plus, he was, il gérait la table, which means he handled the accountancy of the whole market. He wasn't just an isolated um, a street vendor. And uh, they took that away. And uh, as they did that, they also took away his right to issue the uh, bills and notes. They took away everything that documented him and allowed him to get into the global or shall we say at least national place. Those are all the documents. When he couldn't get that, he commits suicide. And it's exactly the same reason of all the other 63. So here we have a whole bunch of people that put, st people that put crowds on the streets that the Middle East has never seen. Huge amounts of, cr of cr crowds. And uh, 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 there is a sort of a disdain of the upper classes, like in Peru, like every Latin American country, for all these people who are supposedly not ready for business. I mean, have they done MBAs? What are you talking about? Get an education. Get a good religion. Mix with the right people. Go to the right schools. What are you doing? And so they forget that before you went to the right schools, by the time that you were taking Peruvian gold and knighting British pirates who took it away from all of us, you didn't need such a great education. People do enterprise. And once you do it well, then come the schools and other things. So, the uh, lesson that one that I uh, the lesson that I would withdraw from that is that you have this apparatus is this. Yeah, I got 178 covers in colors all throughout the Middle East, and I got. I did get the Telegraph, that was nice, the Financial Times, the one article. But on the other ones, they went on for ages. In the Middle East, it resounded. One head of state called me up and said, we have to talk about this. And he said, what is this about people not being paperized, not having the instruments to trade back and forth, not being able to get credit, not being able to use an asset to capitalize oneself? Uh, and I explained to the head of state, and I showed him, I will not mention who is in the Middle East, where in his town people were actually congregating, and that 60%, 70% of his population was in that same situation. And he said, uh, mais c'est très important de ce tour. We must meet with the rest of my cabinet, which we did. I mean, he had invited me over. And we we're talking about this, one of his ministers picked up, the younger man among them, with a military stance like yours, James. And he walks up to the uh, window and looks, and you know he's going to make a statement. When you're in politics, you know if somebody's looking out the window and ignoring the rest of you, he's about to make a statement. And he turns around and he says, Monsieur le Président, do you know what De Soto is telling us? He said, no. I said, he's telling us that the bazaar will save the, uh, our country. You know, the small businessmen, you know, the micro-entrepreneurs, isolated out there. And the president looks at me and said, De Soto, Dites-moi que c'est pas vrai. De Soto, tell me it's not true. But that's it. In globalization, we're about 2.5 billion people. We have left, uh, you know, it's the, the you Europeans with Brexit or without a Brexit. We still classify there. You Europeans and the Americans, who must make 700, 800 million people, right? Toss a couple more here, you're maybe a billion if you take your colonies along with you. Then there's third world. Uh, 
westernized guys like me, see my tie, see my shirt, got my wallet. So uh, we're 2.5. Five billion people have been, uh, are not inside the system, and uh, they are there because they don't have the documents. Now here's the other part that we discovered in the Middle East. I've just done a little invention. I'm no longer in the NGO business alone. I'm in the uh, technology business. I've developed a formula where I can actually get the records of any informal sector in the world because they want to be publicized and find out who owns what and where. And basically what we have found out is that everywhere that the West likes what's underneath, oil, petroleum, gas, there is on top an oasis which has the topsoil. Because what happens in Roman law countries of statutory code is the property rights of topsoil are private or belong to tribe, and those below belong to government, to the state. And so nobody takes care of the top because they say these people don't have property. It's obviously communal stuff, right? I mean, you look at Tintin, you look at, you know, darkest Peru. There's not private property. It's not true. It's full of private property, but they're poor people. So who does the enforcing of their property rights? Guerrillas. So we've made a collection now. We've got, those are titles in Syria and uh, the titles of poor people in Syria and Iraq, and they're guaranteed and enforced by the Islamic State. We've done all this from Peru, internet. The, uh, oh, we know some of those people, but it's basically the internet. Those are Al-Qaeda titles, and they cover most of the people on the surface. The other ones are avatar titles. Who's this Brit called Cameron, who inspires himself in uh, Brazilians, the blue people, who actually have their own title and oppose it to oil companies. The other ones are FARC, Colombia, and the other ones are the Shining Path, Peru. They are into the property titling business. And they're the ones that are protecting the poor, while we generally westernized types look at the big pictures, macroeconomics, are they doing things right? That's why I'm so pleased to be here with you, because you're looking at the details of what's really behind all of this. But the fact of the, the, fact of the, uh, of the matter is that if you think about it, Obama, 2016, dropped a little bit over 25,000 bombs just Obama, 27,000 bombs in seven different countries. Now, actually, when you drop bombs, you don't really know who you're hitting. When you title, you know who's there, and you can serve them directly. And that's why a whole bunch of guys with shaved heads, with long beards, are creaming the West as we go, as we continue. And they shouldn't. We should be taking care of those property titles. Now, the next thing that I think is important here is let me talk to you about Peru. In Peru, we're a big mining country, but we have, of course, the Roman law. What's the Roman law? The Roman law in the old days, what, you know, we're all victims of our past. You had a feudal system. You had, of course, also the, uh, uh, the, the enclosures. Right, okay. That makes kind of more difficult to defend private property. So everybody's got their background. Our background is the Romans. <clears throat> the Romans realized that the metal was really deep inside, so they decided the topsoil was property law, and the bottom soil, or the subsurface soil, belonged to the state, sovereign, right? And the reason they also did that was because they wanted to get to the metals, and the other thing is they're the only ones who actually could do it because that's what you did war for. You went, you beat Asterix and Obelix, you got some Brits that you vanquished as well, you took them into slaves, and they dug, they dug 30, 40 meters below the ground, and then you had a metal industry, and you had a mining industry. And that's the way it stayed until today. So wherever you go in most of the world, everything goes in concessions to, it's not like in my days, it was a film called Giant with James Dean, where some guy pumps oil, is bathed in black, goo and says, I'm a millionaire. You can't do that in a Roman law country because everything that's subsoil is government. And so uh, over time, what that has meant is that one ministry called the Ministry of Energy and Mines of Peru decides by finger who gets the concession. So when you're poor, you're there, you're doing a little bit of gold, you're doing a little bit of metals on the topsoil, you're doing a little bit of agriculture, and all of a sudden, rumble, 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 it's Anglo-American, or rumble, 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 with a Peruvian associate, of course. It's BRGM de la France, or rumble, 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 now the Chinese coming in. And then you say, and what happens? And somebody says, I own your cellar. 
I'm going to start digging, and I need the surface. What are you going to give me? So somebody says, well, you got nothing. That's about $8 an hectare. I'm going to give you a little bit of more nothing than usual, 12. Sounds like a good deal. And that's worked for 150 years. So far, so good. But then comes a time when all of a sudden, as soon as everything is in place, here are Peruvian Indians, and the boys with white skins and blue eyes move in with their 4 by 4s and their big machines. So it's like H.G. Wells and War of the Worlds, clump, 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 they come into the country. And uh, there's a shock. And everybody all of a sudden realizes that somehow or other, somebody got more than the rest. And of course, what, you, what was done is you buy real estate at local prices, which in Ayacucho, in Cajamarca, Peru, is nothing. You send the whole thing through a bilateral investment treaty that we have signed with the UK, with the US, with France. All the world has free trade agreements now between each other, bilateral. Unfortunately, we're not back to the most favored nation clause, but that's where it goes. And uh, when you, the things in which both of us believe in. Uh, but you uh, have this bilateral investment treaty, which means that you basically have a system which conforms the property title system in the local country to paper, type of paper that the Securities Exchange Commission of the United States will recognize. That's, securities, that's the Securities Law of 1933, the Securities Law of 1934, and the Sarbanes-Oxley, which basically say, thanks to bilateral investment treaty, did you get a concession from government? No, they don't even ask that. The question is, are the interests of the investors or the interests of uh, those who are going, of the bankers who are going to give you, on one hand, investment, and the other hand, loans guaranteed and safeguarded. And it's a very interesting way of asking every single question that also is in the property title, but at a level of which of its interest for the uh, investors. In other words, the property title is nothing else than 16 questions that the SEC, Securities Exchange Commission, I, I don't know what the organization would be in Britain, Export Credit Guarantee Department, whatever it is, just ask another 25 questions. And that gives you security. That's the title. Because we're 7.5 billion, 7 .5 billion people in the world, we don't know each other. You know, when I came in through, uh, 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 we came in through London, London Airport now, somebody said, ah, Hernando Soto, why does that sound? And I started explaining who I was, and after a while they just took my passport and said, look, I don't have time for you, just give me your passport. I want to see if you got a British visa. So basically <laughs> my, my, my identity travels here, right? I go to the hotel, right, and they say, will you have enough money to pay for the incidentals? And I say, I want you to know, I know there's some Peruvians that have a very bad reputation, but I'm not one of them. And I start saying, look, just show me your credit card. So at the end, all the things and documents that we have learned to be doing with are, safe, are safeguards. They are uh, uh, safe conducts. We have identities, we have entitlements, and those are the ones I carry around with me that allow me to go everywhere. 2.5 billion of us have that, and we can work on scale. And 5 billion don't have that. OK, back to Peru. Back to Peru, what has happened is that all of a sudden, the place is full of what the Peruvians call illegal miners. Not so. They are actually all quite legal. They're just small scale. When somebody says, but wait a second, I've got the registry here of the Ministry of Energy and Mines. Uh, this indicates that these people have, have not been uh, legalized yet. No, wait a second. At the time of the Spanish conquest, when there was a rebellion here, they gave them the title. At the time there was a hydroelectric plant to be built here, and we were going to flood the place up, we moved 1.5 million Peruvians from here to there. All right, what happened to them? We gave them titles. And everybody forget about those titles. The three gorgeous dams in China, all that, are not in the central system, so they don't count. But they are legal, and they are legitimate. So in the case of Peru, we've got 400,000 so-called, excuse me, 500,000 so-called <laughs> informal miners. So, We've started visiting them and found out that there's already forming three, six organizations. It's just beginning. So that's me in the center. Sorry, but I had to take this picture from elsewhere. I didn't want to be, make this a, an ego trip. One, two, three, four, five, six. My last meeting is in Puno, 10,000 people, 500,000 people, and they're starting to block the mines in Peru. Now, when I said they're blocking the mines in Peru, I find, find that they're doing the same thing in Nigeria. And they're starting to do the same thing in Mongolia. And they're starting to do the same thing here and there. The guys on the topsoil have all of a sudden realized that 
the guys that come in through your underground or subterranean can't get there unless they say yes. It's like if you had a, that bottle of water and you say, I own the bottle and I got the water. And I say, yeah, but I own the cork on top. Now what are we going to do? And they're starting to find out that they're strong. And so uh, they're blocked into the case of Peru, $800 billion of proven and probable reserves. So we've got down, gone out and calculated how many minerals are ready to go, owned by European, American, and Chinese firms that uh, actually have proven and probable reserves. And they are talking about prosperity, $168 trillion, which is more than you Europeans, but well, you're still in the system, just a joke, and the Americans, and the Americans over seven or eight years. That's a lot of money. All right, back to a British film, Avatar. In come the Argentines, and they say, I got a concession to the subsoil in the Amazon. And it wasn't everybody who goes out and says, ah, oh, the natives, you know, they're protecting ecology, et cetera. We shouldn't let them. No, no, they've got their own titles. And their own titles are much more powerful than the ones today of these uh, international firms. What's happened, the way we're trying to figure out, but you know, seen from Latin America. When somebody takes care of Latin America in Europe and the, the States, they call them a Latin Americanist. Well, I'm a North Americanist. And I'm also a Europeanist. I try and study and figure you out. And here's what's the way I figure out. What happens is when you get somebody like my friend President Clinton becomes president, and he uh, says, uh, what do we do? Uh, so he hires Larry Summers, whom I debated just about 10 days ago in Kiev. And they take a guy who's popular with the bankers. And uh, that handles Treasury. But then when it comes, what do you do? Because you need the left also in the United States to deal with other people. Well, then you put Bob Reich into the Ministry of Labor and my friend Madeleine Albright into the United Nations. Now they, for some reason or other, though they've made a lot of money, don't like the guys on the right. So they don't meet and form the Washington consensus. How do you get good money? How do you get you know, stable currencies, et cetera? They go and they meet in Geneva and certain parts of the United Nations, which as everybody knows, are crypto-communist. So, <laughs> I joke. And then what they've gone in there, and is that on the sidelines, because they're not front lines, they've started doing international labor organization, uh, Article 169, uh, fair globalization, 11 major, uh, major treaties, international, signed by Republicans, signed by conservatives, signed by laborers, signed by Democrats, signed by everybody in the West, which says you cannot do anything that relates to the surface without consulting with the poor who are on it and taking care of the ecology. Absolutely reasonable. Well, time has passed, 30 years. We're not quite there 30 years, 29 years. And those things through twists and turns of recodification, reorganization, reinterpretation, have now gone all the way down to Ministry of Energy and Mines of Peru, and it is no longer right to consultation. They authorize or they deny, and they're blocking $800 billion worth of projects. So little people complaining about globalization is an international problem. And we are here sitting, we are here sitting our poor on some of the biggest reserves, and I've only talked about minerals. How about those that are sitting on forests? How about those that are sitting elsewhere? And we can't get at them because the right to get at them is exclusively done for those whose property rights and paper, like my passport and my credit card, can cross borders, which is what we were talking about before, Felipe. So the phenomenon is the following one. Everybody likes globalization, but you are going to like it more if you participate in it. Otherwise, it's going to look like a privileged game. And when that happens, then you get a fellow like President Trump who comes along and he doesn't use the word, I'm against globalization. He says, I'm against globalism. Listen well. In other words, what he's saying is, I don't think we're going to be able to find a solution at the level of global organization. I think they're, they're stuck. In other words, there's the left hand of Adam Smith, which uh, is written up in uh, we were talking about this yesterday, uh, James. It's written up in the theory of moral sentiments, where the 
he says that the invisible hand is that rich people actually do have sensitivity towards the fortunes or misfortunes of others. And on the other hand, we've got the wealth of nations who says selfishness actually works for you. These two things, well, those two Western manifestations, one is coming in through Geneva, the other one's coming in through uh, Washington, and the twain are about to collide is where I see things. Thank you very much. Thank you.